I know many of you are working from home and some of you are back on campus. I hope you're all doing well during this difficult time of the pandemic. I'm Joan Lippincott, Associate Executive Director Emerita of CNI, and I'm moderating the nine sessions of this series. Each of you is registered for all sessions, and if you need to miss some, we'll have recordings available for all sessions, as well as a set of questions to guide planning discussions on your own campus. Both the videos and discussion questions for sessions one through three are now on the website. We have two speakers for this session and we'll be taking questions after each. And for our first speaker, if you have any clarifying questions, we'll stop and take them during the presentation. So please type your questions in the chat box at any time. In addition, after the formal one hour session is over, we'll open the mics in case some of you wish to verbally ask questions of the speakers. The chat box is also available to communicate with each other or with me or our technical lead, Beth Sechrist. During the presentations, all participants will be muted. For this fifth session, we'll learn about supporting research, a central topic in most digital scholarship programs. In this webinar series, we're using the term digital scholarship to apply to all disciplines. I'm pleased to welcome our presenters today, Liz Milowitz, head of the Digital Scholarship and Publishing Services Department and co-editor of ScholarWorks, a center for scholarly publishing at Duke University Libraries, and Amy Koshoffer, assistant director for research and data services and co-lead of the research and data services team at the University of Cincinnati Libraries. Their bios are on the webinar site, and I won't take any more time with introductions in order to give our speakers more time. So over to you, Liz. Thank you so much, Joan. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with everyone today. I want to thank my co-presenter, Amy. I've really appreciated the time we had to talk about this presentation uh, beforehand, and I'm hoping you also see a lot of complementarity between our different perspectives. And I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, I really appreciate your interest in this topic, and I hope that this session will be as useful to you as all the other ones have been for me so far. It's been great. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of what I'm going to cover. Um, First, I'm going to really make sure you understand some of the context of how digital scholarship looks at Duke, as others have already noted throughout this webinar series, and I know we'll note in future presentations, context really matters. What, it's important to recognize um, what your environment looks like and what partnerships are possible, uh, given that environment, what resources are available, et cetera. Um, then I'll spend a little bit more time delving to what digital research needs look like in the humanities and social sciences, again, looking at our context and the kinds of support they often require um, so that it's a better way in case this is also newer to you of understanding how that might look like at your um, institution. And then I'll talk at the end about support and adaptations. Spoiler alert, I'm gonna be talking about support all the way through this presentation. So you don't actually have to wait until the end to hear about that. You're gonna hear about it all the way through. But in that last part of the presentation, I'll talk about this support um, in some general terms, so just to kind of remind, here's how this looks at our institution, and then talk about some of the ways that that might adapt or change for reasons um, that have to do with partnerships, changes in the institution, maybe pandemic, those sorts of things. So um, in terms of context, um, really thinking about this, what are those factors influencing digital research support at your institution? Uh, I wear a, a few hats um, in my role. Um, I'll talk for this presentation very specifically about the work of the Digital, Schol Digital Scholarship and Publishing Services Department. I am one of two full-time staff. So there's myself and then there is my uh, colleague, Will Shaw, who serves as a DH consultant. Um, between us, we also do supervision for various students. So we may have one student working with us at a time, you may have three, but in terms of the funding and support um, just for that unit, that's usually the max, although we can also supervise many more students once we throw in those other, those other hats into the ring. Um, I also um, 
want to note here that again, this is a very small department. And so part of what I'll be looking at is and talking about is what support looks like when your resources are very limited, um, but also what that support looks like when you are surrounded by a lot of other units that provide complements to what you're offering. Um, in terms of the Digital Scholarship and Publishing Services Department, we're very project-based and we have an emphasis on digital humanities. Um, as I mentioned before, we're also very small scale. Um, that also is a result of, but also translates into um, a very high touch approach to the ways we work on projects, as well as low direct funding for our department. Um, that does not mean there isn't funding in other ways that affects our department, but in terms of actual staff, that's what um, impacts some of the, our work. Um, we also divide our work into three main areas, our work on projects, our um, consultations, which are these one-on-one -on -one small scale advisement and assist, and then programs, which include things like workshops. Um, I would love to talk with the people who talked about us assessment again um, from from last week but um, I think how you assess that work is a fantastic topic which I will not get into but I'm happy to talk about in Q&A. Um, so where do we fit in the libraries? Within the libraries um, we are one group. Our primary focus is humanities and interpretive social sciences. We do get different sorts of social science questions um, for instance text mining that an economist wants to do but we don't get the kinds of questions that are more data driven our focus is uh, more qualitative research. Um, that said, we have in the libraries an adjoining department, the Center for Data and Visualization Science, that addresses a lot of social sciences questions, as well as um, data sources and data visualization. Um, they are really key partners for us. There are lots of consultations we might do together. There are instructions that we do together. So. Um, I will not discuss their work much beyond this, but I want to flag that really high that in our case, um, this support can be divided. Uh, if we were doing this all ourselves, I can absolutely understand that our department would take on a greater focus on data, but because of the way that we're situated, we are able to focus much more squarely on qualitative research and project development. We also, and I include them uh, just to kind of reference that in our context, Things like um, learning innovation, which is another group within the libraries that focus on instructional design and course building, even though that's technically not research narrowly defined. Within our institution, there's so much overlap between um, a pedagogical need, a research need, and a publishing need that for many groups who are extensively focused just in this one area, we focus on learning and innovation and teaching in the classroom, we will often get referrals from them about projects that don't quite fit in or maybe have more of a research focus. Um, we're currently working with students who are fellows in their program who are working on projects. So in many ways, there are places where we, we absolutely overlap. Um, and also in terms of subject liaisons, um, I really enjoyed Zoe's presentation earlier this week where she was talking about um, some of those interactions with liaisons. Um, they are tremendous in terms of helping us connect. Um, they have been, many of them, just fearless in their approach to learning uh, new skills. So while we, I'll also talk about this a little bit later and I can talk more in Q&A. Um, we have worked to do more workshops with them to, um, to build up kind of what, what it is that we can each do together and we have different programs, but they're also um, part of what we see as kind of our immediate sphere. I totally left people out. I feel like I'm doing an Oscar speech. So there's, it's much more complicated than what I'm going to show you here today, but, um, but there's a lot going on in the libraries in that context. And then um, digital research support at Duke. Um, the, this is also, I feel like the, through Billy Coates Scruff, there's going to be a fantastic presentation and Amy's slides of the ways that this kind of support can be visualized across the entire campus. I'm giving you just a very focused and PowerPoint uh, limited view of it. But um, in terms of like how we work across campus, we do re rely a great deal on the fact that we have a centralized IT that provides things like enterprise-wide access to WordPress. Um, we rely a great deal on the kinds of technology support that's provided through um, the College of Arts and Sciences technology support. There are many groups in those respects who can also provide some of that 
additional infrastructure. And then within the Franklin Humanities Institute, I just want to call them out as well because they have been such long-term partners with us in terms of uh, funding, um, in terms of bringing groups together. So there are lots of different ways that we see them as helping to provide the support beyond just I'm helping you find a tool and learn how to use it. And I really want to emphasize this um, in some ways to get away from a way of perceiving our work that is perhaps too limited, where we're only focused on the unit, but we're not really looking at the larger ecosystem. And I think the more that we recognize how we interrelate and interact with each other, the stronger our own ability to engage with that system will be. Finally, the requisite slide about Duke. Um, we're mid-sized uh, research one institution, private. We have a number of institutes and centers, and those institutes and centers are also particularly strong influencers of the work that we do um, because they're interdisciplinary in nature, and they pull together different parts of the research community. So even though a project may be very humanistic in nature, it might actually arise from a sciences or a, a, a professor working out of, um, for instance, an environmental institute. So it can vary widely. And so some of the things that come to us um, are not things that necessarily we think, oh, that's a humanities project because that professor brought it, but it turns out it has a lot of the the kinds of challenges as we'll see in the next section, the digital research needs of humanities. So um, thinking again about your institution, what are those specific digital scholarship needs for researchers at your institution? Um, and how do those manifest? Um, coming back again to the idea of uh, kind of what's the, the context, but also to give you a little sense of how this has developed over time and what, why the digital research needs I'm about to discuss came into being. Um, I won't completely unpack this timeline. I did share my slides if you want to look at that more closely. But there are a few things I want to point out um, that, are, that help to kind of highlight key factors. The digital research needs at our institution were aided significantly in their development as well as their support by funding programs. So as funding and incentives came into being, certain types of digital research needs were likely to emerge or at least um, became able to be supported. And because of those funding programs, there was other support that could be available to um, enable those projects to go forward. Um, the Digital Scholarship and Publishing Services Department's work has been generated and supported by these initiatives um, that provided initial funding for the DH consultant position in our department. Um, it also has funded over time those one to three uh, graduate assistants who would work with us on digital projects um, and also has provided a wealth of projects for them to work with. So it's, um, it has been a virtuous, uh, I don't know if it's a circle necessarily, but it's a virtuous swarm of activities and opportunities. And the projects that have arisen from these initi initiatives and uh, I think critically the services and spaces that we've developed in response have also been mutually supportive. So it's not really, uh, it's not a judgment, it's an observation that those kinds of initiatives can push um, certain types of digital research forward um, and make it, it leads to some interesting trends uh, in the humanities at Duke. Um, in this case, um, we see that a lot of the digital research that we work with are tend to be collaborative or team-based. They tend to be experimental, so they're, um, really trying something new, not so much, uh, I heard so-and-so has done this, how do I do this? But I'm gonna try this thing and I'm not sure if it'll work or not, but let's, let's test it out. And um, critically that they are often, as I mentioned earlier, research, teaching and publishing often all kind of fall together within the same experimental project. And third, that they're grant funded. So by highlighting that, it means it's time limited. Um, it has very specific outcomes it needs to meet. So collaborative experimental grant funded are some of those research trends that we're seeing and that I'll talk about. Um, uh, project teams are uh, one of those key elements. So uh, things like Bass Connections, which was mentioned in that, that timeline, and its spin-off projects, Story Plus, which is predominantly humanities research, and Data Plus for quantitative research, uh, have been um, major catalysts and accelerants for team-based research at Duke. 
one of the initial challenges that very first year when it came out was finding space for these teams to meet. Um, a space that wasn't limited in terms of access to the space during all hours of the day, the fact that it could be reservable for a, a group and not dedicated exclusively to a particular group, that it could, could be convenient to everyone who needed to meet, um, that it could be flexible in terms of how many people could be in the space at one time, um, and that neutrality as well, this, the fact that it wasn't one uh, institute that was kind of managing the space. So that was a place where the library certainly stepped in and that was dry, it drove um, a lot of thinking around the development of the edge. In fact, this picture here on the slide of students uh, working together is in one of those rever reservable project rooms in the edge. So here's an example of a project team. A science professor of uh, working with documentary film footage from a nonprofit environmental organization uh, forms a team of graduate and undergraduate students to catalog footage. So needs here, digitization of that footage, service space for storing the footage, workflows for describing the footage, video editing software, guidance on copyright and permission, um, a range of things, not to mention project planning. All of those things together amounted to more of a workflow challenge. It's also not things that immediately suggested um, other places to go. This was more of a project area and digitization was one in particular that took a lot of work to negotiate. Um, so, I mean, I'll pose these questions rhetorically and then I'll move along. Um, questions about, well, why is this a humanities project? What makes it one well suited to work in the libraries is one I would ask. And what services does it suggest to you that would be needed to support this kind of project? So those are some of the things that I, I hope we'll, um, we can discuss more in the Q&A, but that's the kind of example that I'm talking about and the kinds of needs that potentially emerge from these projects and the support needed. I told you I'd talk about support. Okay, so the other um, a, a third area is, uh, sorry, a second area was humanities labs and DH pedagogy. So this is the experimental aspect of these, um, these different research needs. Uh, the collaborations might result in, here we have example of a emerging infectious diseases article in which uh, the team of students who worked on that project uh, are actually cited in the article. In fact, some of the work that they did is also linked in the article. Um, this timeline here is showing a number of those humanities labs, the fact that they were um, very specifically oriented. They had a, a period of development after which they might continue their work, they might not. Um, and much of that work um, would also involve experimenting with different sorts of tools. Scalar and Omeka were both um, some of those. They're web-based, we didn't need to host them, but it's a different kind of support that was needed, which might be helping people understand the best way to use it, understanding how it could be both a research tool and a pedagogical tool at the same time, other ways that they might um, host it um, if they wanted this tool to keep going with them after they graduated. So case in point, Sonic Dictionary. This emerged from one of those labs. It was an experiment in pedagogy. Um, in this case, like, so as it was developed, it was a pilot, a prototype to see how this would work. Um, some of the things that were needed were really developing guidelines for description and helping students understand metadata, which led to fascinating uh, conversations in the classroom. Planning for sustainability, um, that started at the very beginning where we were asking questions about how are you gonna demonstrate its value? Um, how are you going to build in new contributors? Who might those contributors be? Um, would you have predicted that it might be someone who does cochlear implants and wants to help someone train and learn how to actually understand what a sound sounds like as they're training to understand sound as this coming through their brain? There are so many different ways that this could have been used that we couldn't predict. But part of that sustainability planning is something that was possible for us to do as part of the support early on. Um, and finally, uh, that grant funded element. So we had projects and fellows who worked with us um, whose time was very limited. And so they had very specific things they need to be able to get done and then move on. Um, I want to, I know I've got to keep going uh, quickly, but uh, the example I want to really highlight here in this case was a visiting faculty fellow, uh, Meredith Goldsmith, who was on the uh, previous page came to do to these, develop these scalable research projects for undergraduate humanities students. So really what she was there, she was learning how to learn, how to tell people, other people, instructors, as well as students, how to do the 
this work. So it wasn't merely help me set up this GIS uh, instance, but it was really asking the question of how do I actually pinpoint um, and map movements of characters in a historically realistic novel like Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence. So it's intellectually challenging as well as uh, raise questions, technical challenges about how to map and then how to document this type of work, which I, I don't know that we do or, or, or raise high enough in our discussions of how we support digital scholarship. If it's not documented, how does it get repeated? I, and we say that in terms of sustainability, but even just sustaining it from the, the individual doing the project to the next person who's gonna work on it, maybe the next class. So those are some elephant, uh, elements of this uh, that were particularly interesting for us and how we support digital scholarship. One other element I wanna highlight in terms of digital research needs. So all of these things work together. You have the particular content, it's qualitative. It could be maps, images, text, audio. Um, you have the ways that people wanna work with it. Maybe they're doing close analysis, maybe they're doing distant analysis, maybe they're categorizing, but there are different ways that they wanna work with that content. And then there are things they actually have to do to actually get that content in shape or make sure that they understand how to apply the method or even just to get the project moving. So there are all of these moving parts that are part of just that project that we're helping people to think through. Then there are these other layers that those other digital research needs pointed to, which are that a lot of these were collaborative. How do we figure out the project in a way that more than one person can do it? How do we figure out the project in a way that it meets those grant needs in the time frame that the grant has with the resources the grant provides? And how do we think about sustainability of that project beyond the experimental phase? Not everybody's interested in that. And that's always a good question to ask, but sometimes that may be something that occurs later. And so that was also part of our process. And when we think about high touch, what we're often thinking about is, do we have opportunities to ask those questions and help those projects keep moving forward? So final point, forms of support and adaptation. So how do we support it? But also how do we adapt that support over time? Uh, forms of support. I talked to earlier on about programs, projects, and consultations. Um, all the pictures you see here are of, in a past life, in a past place. This is pre-pandemic, um, mostly in a Murthy Digital Studio, but also in a project room in the edge. Um, much of what we did um, and what we continue to do is really centered in um, the staff. It's what the staff knows and it's the staff finding ways to engage with those individuals in different ways to help assist. Whether it's doing that consultation, whether it's um, teaching a course, whether it's leading a project. I will say that, I would say a secondary investment in terms of thinking about the support you're offering is the space and the equipment. And I put them there because um, I don't think we should ever Forget the fact that the people are really critical in helping to make sure that those services connect um, and that we can think through some of what is needed and help build those programs out and recognize those other partnerships that are available. Um, space and equipment are also important. In our case, they didn't need to happen quite so much as those people, but they also are really essential in terms of making sure that you have room for people to work for for those meetings to happen and then of course um pandemic <laughs> so space means something completely different now um we do continue to provide the support that we did we still advise um we still equip and train and partner it just happens in slightly different ways some of these are things that are available um uh, really only one of these I'll point to is Queer Claim Hosting is a tool that we have pointed people to that's not supported through our institution. Every one of the others is. And so that's a point where it really, you kind of fall back again on what your actual support network looks like at your institution. So having the Office of Information Technology was incredibly important for us. Um, it continues to be, um, it's a support that we don't always have to think about, but it's incredibly important in terms of being able to do the things that we need to do, which is connect. I will also say that um, over time, um, whether or not you're in a pandemic, people move on, um, the organization may shift focus, they may reinvest different ways in what they think they need to uh, put higher value on. 
Um, so for us, uh, we did have an individual who was working with the College of, Techn uh, of Arts and Sciences Technology Services who moved on. We don't have that connection, so that connection to that group is not as strong as it was. However, we do, do still continue to meet regularly. Um, the individuals in CDVS and in um, my department, as well as uh, individuals in the Franklin Humanities Institute, individuals in the Wired Lab, which has emerged as a really strong partner in working through and thinking about these issues, um, as well as staff in learning innovation, regularly meet and talk through what are our collective needs, what are ways we can advocate for that. The last point I wanna raise is really a a series of questions and it's it's really asking about that small scale and about scaling uh, i think we always want to say how can we continue to do this for more people and there's great great value in that um, i also really ask coming back to the slide about um, assessment what are we scaling to um, and really i think we have to really interrogate what that looks like in, in our institution and where, where that really is a benefit and to what purpose. Um, because we are working with a lot of different partners, it's really asking a question, um, where are we moving into? What is the growth needed? What's not being met? So I think it does point to having these conversations. And it's also asking, um, is, does this make sense for your institution? So asking not just, can I do this um, at this particular moment, but, can I do this over time? How will I sustain the broader scale? Um, and, and if I can't do that, who do I need to work with to make that support possible? And not get simply in the mentality, if my part department can't do all of it, I don't know that we should even try. I think really it's thinking about what that partnership could look like. And I, I um, welcome your questions. And I also welcome hearing from Amy when she talks about this more in her presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. That was so comprehensive and I was especially interested in so many links between research, teaching and learning and uh, would love to talk to you more about that. I'm going to start with one question. We'll have a little bit of time for Q&A right now and more at the very end of the whole session. Uh, it, it really speaks somewhat to your last point, and I'd like to know whether you have any formal guidelines for negotiating projects. You know, you've, you've listed so many types of support for various projects that you gave as examples. How do you decide at the outset or along the way what you can and can't do? So we have, and I thank you for bringing up this question because I was on my list of, don't forget to mention this, and I didn't mention this, but and when we uh, began our department and also as we um, have grown over the years, it's, there has been pretty consistently a, a major grant initiative with pre-approved projects to which we are committed to providing support. To that extent, that part of it has been removed. We know that we will work with this project or at least we will consult with them. And if we can't partner on it, we'll figure out what, who else they might be able to work with. Um, one of the tools that we have used in those projects specifically, even though they're kind of pre-approved, has been a, a basic project plan. Um, it, when it's not filled in, it's one page. Um, we try to really keep it very, very brief but it's intended to clearly articulate, this is why we're doing this. And it's also um, a way that we can sit down and talk with the people that we're working with to articulate, you know, if we're gonna devote this time, I wanna make sure that we're both invested and that we both see this as a partnership and we kind of share that risk. And so where we've, we've um, pushed ourselves to really continually fill that out and revisit it. So it's not just like, here's what we said, but that we come back and, and look at that plan again, um, mostly to reaffirm what it is that we're all invested in to achieving, not in a contract sense. And I, I could absolutely hear some people who might be saying like, but what if this? And I totally hear you on that. But we really have pushed it um, in terms of a, a, um, a, a commitment around a shared interest um, because we wanted to establish this as a partnership not as a transaction so it, for us it's really important to establish that up front so i do have that tool which i'd be happy to also share if others want to see 
The other thing I'll say is, um, especially this summer, we have done a lot of um, thinking about the way that we've managed the projects that we take on and the degree to which we've been explicit about these are our skill sets and these are not. I mean, I think we've been, it's been easy for us up to this point because we have a broad network to talk among each other and say, could you do this project? Okay, like this is probably, you should go talk to them. But I don't think we've made it explicit what we're taking on. And I, especially in thinking about decolonization and anti-racism, one of the things that our department will be working on is looking to actually make those criteria more explicit and then to really push ourselves uh, to be, to accept and work with projects very explicitly and overtly that we believe will help act towards a different type of environment around digital scholarship. Um, we are still developing that, but I, I flag that because I think it's it's been something that has not been in our radar as fully, even though we have been thinking about it. And it's important to me that we push that forward as part of our selection. Thank I'm you. seeing some questions. I'm also looking. Liz, we'll take one more question, but we need a quick answer from you, please. Mm -hmm. Can you describe how decisions are made administratively about which service areas you invest in and how you grow new service areas? Uh, and I see Micah. Thank you, Micah. That's a good question. Um, administratively, uh, I will say within, if you're saying within our department, we have a lot of leeway to simply make that it's two people and I just say, can we do this? Sure. And we go. Now, in terms of investing in new services, let me take as an example. Almost five years ago, we set for our department a five-year plan to, um, to move, put ourselves on a more curricular footing and to say we want digital scholarship to be part of the curriculum. So there's so much leeway at our institution to kind of set our goals and move forward. Where, do, where would we have to get more, more buy-in if we were saying we need more resources? And I think it's a really, I think that's the question we should all be asking ourselves is what are we doing without resources? And to what extent do we have to flag that and say this is not actually sustainable? So we'll, we'll have a lot of room to experiment, not necessarily a lot of room to grow something that is at an institutional level is sustained, but there's a lot of room to build a proof of concept. I don't know if that answers your question, Micah, but I'll stick around after the talk today if you have time. Thank you very much, Liz, and I appreciate your really um, excellent answers. If you would, yes, yeah, stop your uh, share screen, and Amy, if you can put your slides up, I'll turn this over to you. And they look just fine. Thank you, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much and it was an excellent and wonderful presentation by Liz and um, really appreciate all the information that you've shared and I'll come back to some of the questions as well that Liz has raised in my presentation. So I am I'm going to click on this. I am from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, the University of Cincinnati is a very urban um, university. We are located just north of the heart of Cincinnati and one of the um, key um, components of education at the University of Cincinnati is experiential learning. Um, we call it the co-op or cooperative education and started at the university in 1906. So it's been a long tradition of students having um, experiential learning as a part of their education process and research falls um, very firmly in that category of experiential learning. Uh, university library system, we are a very geographically dispersed system um, with uh, two regional campuses. We have a uptown campus, which is where I am based, which is split in between an east side and a west side. Um, the east side is the medical campus and the west side is where I am based, where much of the undergraduate um, learning happens. Um, because uh, I, on our campus, the east and west side are um, our system, our research and data services team, um, we work with our medical colleagues. They are a part of our research and data services team. And that's something I think that's somewhat unique to our team. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I have a long uh, career before coming to the library in doing research. I was an assistant uh, research assistant in dermatology and cell biology. So I have that experience myself and I bring that to the work that I do and combine that with my information uh, professional training. Um, the areas that I focus on, I'm going to talk you know, very mostly from a STEM perspective in my talk today. And I have done uh, 
I do the support for data management. Um, I oversee students who work in our um, data visualization and GIS and data lab. And um, I work on data literacy support as well. So about our team, um, our research and data services team, we are really interested in promoting research efficiencies and thinking about best practices. And so we teach on the, those best practices. Um, we teach data literacy skills and we work to provide what I would call customized support. We are very interested in partnerships and um, that being the title in my talk, um, we are really interested in engaging with the researchers as a partnership and also reaching out to others who are working in this space on our campus. Um, and then lastly, we, we raise uh, awareness. It, the library has been the lead on research data management issues um, on our campus. And so we bring awareness about the policies and trends and practices that are impacting our research environment. Um, as I mentioned, our team is very geographically dispersed between our East Campus and West Campus. Um, here are the members of the Research and Data Services team and the affiliated faculty that we work very closely with. Um, these are library faculty, I should say. Um, I'm highlighting in red the leads um, on, these, uh, on our Research and Data Services team. Um, I'm highlighting Ted Baldwin, who's the director of our Science and Engineering Library. Our research and data services started as a strategic initiative and Ted was one of the um, key uh, leads on that project and has brought the unit and has um, shaped what our philosophies are to this point. Currently our team is led by Tiffany Grant who is based on the medical campus, um, my, co my counterpart on the medical campus and myself. Um, this is a little information about how our services have evolved over time. Um, like I said, it started as a strategic initiative back in 2013. And in the seven years, we've um, increased our services, we've added staff. Um, I'm hiding lighting and colors every time where we've invested resources into our team. So by hiring the three informationists, I was a part of that cohort that came in. Um, at that time, we were focused mostly on research data management, but when we came in and, um, with my colleagues, we started to think about support for medical informatics. Over time, we developed GIS services, which is a, an area that I'm focused on. Um, then we hired a data visualization specialist and could start to um, provide data science support. And now we're moving into an area which we are calling digital integration. And we think of this as every student and every researcher needs um, to have very technical skills to survive in our current environment and especially in that experiential learning and taking um, there's these technical skills into the workforce. So we are going to start to develop thinking about much more support for upskilling the students and the researchers. Um, we formed as an official unit in the library in 2019. So that meant we were given um, a guaranteed stable budget. Doesn't mean that the amount was guaranteed, but we at least had a budget and we had um, staffing and a reporting structure um, in 2019. And that's when I became um, one of the leads of it. Okay. So to think about developing relationships, I'm gonna, uh, also highlight the questions that Liz was asking about, you know, thinking about the research needs of people coming to seek our services, you know, what are those needs, what are the research and can we support them. For me, this process is very much about those personal relationships. I mean, my work, I can't do it without building personal relationships to people. Um, that's the way I function and that's the way I've approached the, um, the development of the work that I do. But I also think a lot about what makes this library work. Um, given the nature of our team, we had two PhDs on the team for a while, and they could think about, you know, setting up their own lab, establishing something external to the library. But for me, I'm thinking, what makes this library work? And it really has to do for me about the way that I think about information, the way that I organize information, and a guiding principle of you know, libraries being about the access and preservation of information. And I translate that into the research support that I do to, to have people think about, you know, access and preservation of the information so that they can continue to reuse the data that they're developing. Um, we really want to partner with units on our campus that are doing this work as well. So like our Office of Research, our Central IT. And so we are looking for people um, to partner with who have 
Synergy with us, um, thinking about um, you know, grant support or infrastructure, and how can we partner with them and build services from there. Okay, so we have a three-tiered model to the engagement that we have with um, people coming to seek our services. This is triage, amplify, and partnership. And these are very fluid classifications and something can go very quickly from being just a triage situation to being an amplify. Our, our gold standard would, for, would be to form as many partnerships as we can. We'd love to be PIs on grants. We'd love to um, have authorship on papers. If we can get to that point in a relationship, that's great. We're really um, happy. But I also know that a lot of things will be in between amplify and partnership. But like I said, it's a very fluid classification from pointing somebody to a LibGuide versus ha helping them to select a particular software. Um, I support, like I said, the STEM areas. Um, I'm highlighting in red the bioinformatics because that's something that I actually don't do. That's more the class um, area that my colleague on the medical campus will do. But we look for partnerships um, in these various areas. Okay, so some of the partnerships that we've been able to form um, have been through instruction, research, and innovation. So um, thinking about instruction and how we can form partnerships, uh, the Director of Undergraduate Research, who is based in our College of Experiential Learning and Career-Based Education, again, thinking about the co-op experience, came to uh, the library and asked if we would partner with her and participate in a series of lectures that she was developing. Um, they are very much based on helping undergraduate researchers develop self-advocacy skills to make sure that they can optimize their research experience. And we partnered in the beginning with just by um, participating in one lecture. But after that series was over, I went to her and said, I'd really like to expand my role in this. Um, what does that look like for you? And is that something that you're interested in? And finding somebody who has the this vision and has the, the synergy to say, this is great, let's work on this together. She brought me in as a partner and she and I then sat down and developed the curriculum for the next year. Um, that was a very successful year. We were able to um, really flesh out a series of 10 weeks, what students could learn over the 10 weeks and really develop those self-advocacy skills um, that they would need to be successful in a research program. Um, this past summer, we did a third iteration of it, and she brought in one more partner, and I brought another partner from the library, and we expanded again, and that's the, the curriculum that you're seeing on the slide there. So that was an example of a very personal relationship that I was able to expand on, develop, that then became a service that we are now offering every summer to partner with this um, team and provide this instruction for students. Another example of a really great partnership that has happened um, is one that Ted Baldwin and Rebecca Olson are involved in, and that is our relationship with our Venture Lab. This is a program at the University of Cincinnati which helps researchers, community members, and um, other, say, students who are interested in taking something from research into commercialization. And a role that the library can play there is to really help with the competitive intelligence research that happens. In the beginning, um, the very first cohort that they partnered with, the, the team did the research for them, but then it was realized that it would be much more successful in teaching the, the participants in the cohort to do this research themselves. And now they have been through, I believe it's up to nine cohorts where they've been working with these partners and teaching them how to do these skills. And it's a um, very, um, very successful collaboration uh, to this point. A third way is um, actually to get in and, and to apply for grants with a researcher. So the last example on this slide is where we applied for an informationist supplement. So we um, got money from NIH, it's about $25,000 a year, and we partnered with a researcher to bring librarians into that research group and to have goals that were very much focused that supported the research, but also were very based in library work. So we developed information for the website and we taught, um, we worked with them to bring some data into our repository. And this was an example of a partnership that we were able to take in the research environment. Okay. Uh, sometimes we're able to develop relationships through challenges that we're facing. As I mentioned, it's the library that is the lead 
on data management issues on our campus. Um, data management is not always a sexy subject and a popular subject and researchers are more like, I want the grant and I want the paper. Um, I don't think so much about, you know, what I'm going to do with this data in five years. Um, but we were able to um, connect with people in the Office of Research and they developed a, a data management task force. Um, unfortunately, the task force only lasted for about a year and a half, but we were able to um, put together a paper from that that highlighted the research needs, in this case of um, social science researchers. And that paper is still there. Um, we are able to refer to it and say, you know, this is the common themes of these researchers. And it would be something that we can take into a next relationship with the Office of Research to hopefully develop support for that. Um, I serve now on the faculty um, research and scholarship committee. And so this is another place where I can bring that kind of um, partnership um, to develop services and raise awareness at our office of research level. Um, an example of another challenge is that um, when we took on the GIS support, um, we found that not being the administrator of the access to the technology, that there were times where we would maybe want to facilitate a workshop or something and we weren't able to get the licenses. So by being in an administrative role, um, having a partnership with the IT who was working in that role, we were able to then get access and now it's a much more seamless process. So these challenges give us a chance to develop relationships with other entities on the campus. I'm mentioning, you know, the Office of Research and our IT department at UC. To me, these are the very big key players that we need to build personal relationships with. With our Office of Research, it's taken a long time. It's been seven years and we've um, worked hard to um, communicate with them and to develop a, a relationship. Sometimes these are personality driven. Um, as I mentioned with the, the task force, it was very one particular person who was interested in that. Um, I think we need to try to work to get to a culture of more interaction between us, but we are, we are making headway. So right now we were just able to get a member of our team, Tiffany Grant, onto our research advisory council through the Office of Research. And we are also starting to participate in their training programs. So we get the branding under the Office of Research. Um, specifically, we are talking about training in infrastructure, data management plans, and building an NIH biosketch. Our partnership with our IT department has been um, much more, um, it's long lived um, from the very beginning of my time at, with the library. Um, we just have found a synergy and that's the place where we are really able to have con constant conversations um, and build partnerships there. We serve on their uh, IT governance and research and development committee. And we have also put in for grants together. So we have created a series that's funded by our provost and that's been a really great partnership for us to build services from and training um, through this series. And we also partner on our annual day to day, which um, we had to postpone due to the pandemic. And we are going to be holding that um, at the end of October. Okay, so for our um, research and data services team, we are going through some um, organizational changes. We are going to be merging with our digital scholarship center. Um, the Scholarship Center started also as a strategic initiative, but is become much more the research engine for our library unit. And so in merging with our Digital Scholarship Center, that will bring our team much more um, access and partnerships to research. Um, the Digital Scholarship was very successful to get a Mellon grant. So they brought in a million dollars to set up the Scholarship Center, and they were just successful with a renewal and so we'll be continuing that work and focusing on um, machine learning and um, transdisciplinary research. That's been the focus of the Digital Scholarship Center before, but now with the merger with the uh, research and data services team, this will also encompass their thinking about data management and research efficiencies and also open science and research reproducibility. When we merge together, um, we will be the digital integration unit. I'm not sure if they're going to be a technical name change, but it'll be um, the unit that's supporting this new process of digital integration. And we will be um, forming an actual space that will be a digital core within our library. Some of the first steps of merger, um, it's been interesting to try to bring these two cultures together. Our research and data services team has been very focused, I said, on the 
on the services component of supporting research, where the Digital Scholarship Center has been very active in supporting research by partners and being, you know, the grants and partners in a grant. So we are starting to incorporate ourselves more into these different projects. There's a lot more projects going on, but these are the four of the ones that I'm involved in at the moment. And um, interestingly enough, I'll highlight the first project um, with digitization of um, herbarium cards. This is a STEM researcher, but it's also a humanities project, right? Because they're looking at text. And so this has been a very interesting um, partnership because I met this professor maybe slickly on the third day of my um, time in the library. And we have been able to talk and build a very close relationship over time. And by having that personal relationship with the researcher, I was able to make a connection for him through the Digital Scholarship Center. And now his work is being supported through the Digital Scholarship Center. And so again, you know, these personal relationships really translate well into services for us. Okay. Um, our next step is to really think about what does this digital core look like? Um, here you can see there's a lot of different partners. This is the slide that Liz alluded to earlier. And you can see that um, it really is a scope that would span all these different partners and try to have them integrate together to form this digital core that would support students um, upskilling with these technical skills and to really integrate all the different partners that could participate. The libraries is there, but we would be focusing on these three major structures of teaching, research, and services, which I think Liz also mentioned as kind of being the staples of her work. And I, myself, I find myself more comfortable in the teaching component of this, but any member of our research and data services team will be able to, to support any part of this triad of, um, of function, teaching, research, or services. Okay. And then the future steps are, um, after we are more of a structured unit, we will be moving into um, membership in what is called our Digital Futures. This is an Office of Research um, initiative, and our Digital Scholarship Center will have a um, space in this building and will be an anchor team. And so we will be able to then bring research and data services into this space and support researchers in this new facility. And then also as the provost is supporting our digital core, this helps us to think about the fulfillment of what is known as our Bearcat promise that we will be bringing students much more into these skills and thinking about these skills through teaching um, a semester long course. So this is what, um, the next steps in our digital integration will look like. And I think that's the end of my presentation. So I appreciate the um, attention. And if you wanted to talk to me, you can email me at askdata at uc.edu. Amy, thanks so much for that excellent presentation. Uh, what you're building there is so comprehensive and so clearly tied to the institutional priorities. Really interesting. Um, I'm going to ask each of you a question that came up at the end of Liz's presentation. Liz, I'm going to ask you the question first. And Amy, while Liz is answering, if you could share the citation of the article you mentioned about the social science researchers. I don't know if it was a paper or a published article that you mentioned is still being used. Uh, one of our participants asked for that. You could type it in the chat if if you can provide a link. And after Liz answers um, this question, we'll, we'll ask you the same. Um, is, is that okay, Amy? Do you know what we're referring to? Um, it, it'll take me a moment, so okay. let me try to Thank look you. for it. So Liz, was there a discussion at the beginning of your presentation or just in general uh, in terms of your work about ethical considerations such as labor issues, diversity, giving credit to graduate students and postdocs, et cetera. And the uh, person comments, universities and libraries can be very hierarchical. Um, I really appreciate this question. I did not discuss that, um, I don't think at all in this presentation, um, it, it, but it's something, and it surprises me now that when you're asking this, we, um, so let me just say a couple of things. We used to have practicum students who worked with digital scholarship because we have a number of library science programs around us. We stopped doing that because we couldn't pay them. 
because I had looked into this and read and it was like wages for unpaid work and it felt like that that was not appropriate. That was a hard decision to make, but that was certainly an ethical choice that we made. Um, I still debate that because I think that there are individuals who have benefit, benefited, um, but that was a concern. Um, we do have students who are paid and then the question for us was, is it enough that they're getting paid? or should we be considering other aspects of their professional development? And years and years ago, we did talk about this. In fact, there was a, on the wall, the, the glass wall in my office, there was this uh, grid, uh, these axes, where we talked about like, what are the motivations? Why would people do it? Um, why would they do this work? And for us, um, they might be motivated by money, but for us, that wasn't really a consideration for why we wanted people to work with us. We really wanted this to be an educational experience. So um, I will say one, you didn't ask about this, but let me pull this in because one of the ethical considerations for us was always that when we start that semester with a student, we have a conversation about what they wanna get out of this. What's their professional goal and what's intrinsically motivating them and what do they hope to learn? So that that could always guide us in questions about what's the work you're doing? If there's a choice, is there something else you could be doing that actually puts you on a path to developing the skills you want? So there's both, a Decision, can we pay them? And that's a consideration. There's a question about what do you want to do when you're doing this work? And that's a consideration. And then the question about getting credit. To the extent there's room to give credit, we do give credit. Um, there isn't always room to publicly do that. And that is a dilemma. And I would be interested in how others do this. What we do is we list every individual who's worked with us, the projects they work on, and the work that they did on our, on our webpage. I can provide you a link to that if you want to see how we've done that because we wanted to provide a place where that could be at least visible. I think there are plenty of other places have done a better job of designing that than we have. We just got it up, but we did want to be able to credit them in that way. And I'll say one other thing. I did talk about the project plan. I said it was really important. Another really important aspect of that project plan was clearly defining the role of the student, because if we were working with a student, we wanted to make it clear, this is what the student is actually being asked to do, and this is what's reasonable. And this is not, this is not what the student is being asked to do. And so it was for us also a way to manage um, the student from simply bearing the work of the project and not carrying what was a, an appropriate load given and that everyone else was carrying their load. So those are those different elements of asking, are they getting paid? What's their motivation? Um, are we acknowledging what they did? And is their work equitable in relationship to the rest of the individuals? Um, and in terms of diversity, we do our best. Um, I think there's still a pipeline question, um, but I also think um, there's some questions about how are we supporting students um, who want to come and work with us, um, who are bringing different perspectives than we have. Um, and I think that's some work we still need to do to figure that part out. I hope I answered your question, but if you didn't, please let me know in chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Amy, I'm going to repeat the question for you. Um, can you talk about uh, how you view, not you personally, but your, the, all the units that are involved in digital scholarship, data management, et cetera, uh, about ethical considerations such as labor issues, diversity, giving credit to graduate students and postdocs, et cetera. And then she comments, universities and libraries can be very hierarchical. Yeah, so um, I would say, you know, graduate students have been um, critical to the work that we've been doing and also undergraduates, especially in our GIS. Um, so I refer to um, on the picture or the slide where you saw our team members, there was a, a graduate student there as part of our team. She's very critical to our team. And um, we have hired them as, as um, student workers for our unit. So they are paid a salary and they are given a salary um, for the time that they work. Um, we have been discussing, um, particularly in research and data services, developing an author policy. And we have that worked out but we've not implemented it. But um, I think that it, it, for me, it's really important to acknowledge that when a student has been critical to a work being done, I ask myself, if the student wasn't there, would this work get done? And if the answer that, to that question is that they needed the student to do the work, then the student deserves credit. Um, but I think that we need to put it out as a policy. And so that's why we developed the author policy. Um, 
and that's something that we would talk more after the merger with our Digital Scholarship Center. Um, the Digital Scholarship Center has taken a different approach um, because they are grant based um, like the projects are grant based, they do lay out the work and they guarantee any student that is a part of a project will be an author on the paper. Doesn't mean they'll be first author, but they will be an author on the paper. Those students are also receiving funding. So um, it's a lot more clear in that grant or, or that project based environment than it is in our research and data services team. But um, I think that um, one thing that our students are getting from us is professional development. And I try to stress for my students that work for me that they go to library offered um, events. You know, so like if we're doing a, um, an accessibility training, then I'm going to send my student to that training because they are a part of our team and they deserve that professional development. And um, I think that that has been really helpful for a lot of students um, to be able to put those kinds of things on their resume to get credit for it. Um, I, again, I really appreciate the work that the students do and I want to be a part of their um, professional development and tying back to the self advocacy and research. I also want to help them learn to advocate for themselves as well. So by by empowering them through these different training opportunities that we do. Thank you so much, Amy and Liz, for your excellent presentations and for your really clear answers to the questions. We will continue some informal discussion in just a minute, but right now we're at the end of our hour, so I want to formally thank our speakers and I also thank all the participants. Our next webinar is on Tuesday, September 29th, and our speakers will discuss initiatives in teaching and learning. Mm -hmm.